just open the recording. Right. So without a further ado, can I have the Prime Minister? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, opposition, uh, government, and the adjudicators. Uh, can I just check whether I am audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. The motion is that this house supports the inclusion of feminist narratives in advertisements of fashion and beauty products. Now, I will define this motion. This motion has four key phrases. The first one is inclusion, and the inclusion simply means the involvement of something. Feminist narratives are ideas pushed forward to empower women. Advertisements are the, are, the, are the general display of products to appeal to the public, and fashion and beauty products are products used to enhance individual features. Now I'll go one step further and define what beauty means. Beauty is not simply just looking good but it's actually the state of being confident in how they look. Now, I, I as Prime Minister, will start by ex explaining why uh, we are in support of this motion. My fellow second speaker, Nitwesh, will go over my points as well oh, and also rebut the opposition. And my, and my third speaker, Abia, will, uh, will make the closing statement as well as rebut the opposition. So the first point we have is that is empowerment. So what this does is that it empowers women. Feminist narratives make women less conscious of how they look and make them more happy and make, feel better in their bodies. For example, to love your curves, which is one of the examples given in the emotion, in the motion, it makes overweight women, a woman that have, uh, who have curves, to feel more comfortable in their bodies. In, and in, port, in portraying it into the public. This does, what it does is that it builds self-esteem and makes them more confident. The second point is the promotion of gender equality. It portrays women as strong, it, independent and equal to the male community. The third point is that it discourages beauty standards, specifically unrealistic beauty standards. Nowadays, the beauty standards are discouraging they cause women not to feel that they are good enough. It call, and this in turn could potentially lead to mental health issues for these women. They don't feel that they're good enough. Social media is one thing. Social media uses severe editing in photos. This not only creates a large, um, uh, this not only uh, causes women to feel that they're not good enough, it, uh, it discourages women from being, you are feeling, rejected from feeling safe in their own bodies. Now, even uh, now also in Korea is another example that we have. In Korea, uh, a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of very unrealistic beauty standards. And some people to try to fit with those beauty standards, they go through life altering uh, operations where they change their bodies permanently. Now we are not saying, I would like to say this first, we are not saying that we do not uh, uh, support plastic surgery, but there is a very fine line before it gets extreme. Now, these products, when they offer these feminist narratives, allow a non-extreme pathway for them to achieve that goal. My fourth point will be the sp it's spreading of awareness, the feminist movement. Now, these feminist uh, narratives portrayed on these advertisements, encourages the awareness of the women's struggles and their fights for their rights. In today's world, women still do sure. struggle. And uh, let me finish my point and I'll get to that. So what this does, it will contribute to the goal that all of us have been longing for, which is global, uh, which is uh, gender equality. What this does is it also gives a pedestal for people to voice their concerns. And this helps society progress, progress as a whole. Okay, what is your uh, POI I'll be accepting? New prerequisite to this empowerment is for females to buy the product in which fashion and beauty products are not cheap. How is this accommodatable by every one of the family's movements? Okay, I think that the uh, that you are missing something here. When, of course, 
um, of course, people would have to purchase the product in order to use the product. But the main thing that we're, you're, you're not focusing on is the advertisement. Not everyone has to buy the advertise, uh, buy the product to be able to witness the advertisement. It doesn't matter if the person uses the product. What matters is that the person is able to recognize that the product is pushing a narrative that is in support of them. Whether or not they buy the product is irrelevant to that fact. And that is what, that is what I think you're missing here. And that is also, I, I think, not uh, relevant to this current situation. Don't misinterpret by saying that I'm not promoting the, uh, the purchase of the product, by the way, also just to clarify. So with these points, I feel that this is the government's case to as to why we support this motion and why we feel that feminist narratives should be pushed forward in these advertisements of these beauty products. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the time speech. Can I have theater of the opposition? Leader of God. Um, please give me a few seconds to arrange my things. Thank you. Sure. Um, can I, uh, am I audible and visible right now? The Wi-Fi had a few issues earlier. Yes, and yes. All right, thank you. I'll be, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Okay, so before I get, before I'll start my speech, we're giving a few rebuttals. First, then I'll move on into giving a real context, then move on into my original arguments. Okay, so first of all, for side government, they have given you a definition of just words, of just plain words and phrases, but not without a proper context, which makes it extremely irrelevant to the current motion today. Now, allow me to give you a real definition, a real context that has relevance to our current motion. The debate today surrounds around who can best accommodate the original goals set for feminism to achieve current day. Let's make this clear. The whole movement for feminism is to advocate for women's rights on the basis of equality for the sexes. The point here is to empower women and to promote equality. That is what we should be focusing on today, yet government has failed to properly introduce such definitions. Okay, so moving on to the ads and the, corp and the corporations part of this whole debate. The ones that are promoting such things and are incorporating such ads into their products, let me mention products, are the corporation. Ads are made by the companies to generate profit. We have to keep in mind that this that this, these products, at the end of the day, their only goal is to generate profit. This is just the ads that are incorporating feminism is just a, just because there's a phase, there's a surge wave of current feminist movement. That is why the corporations are willing to invest and to make these advertisements surrounding feminism. These, com these companies and corporations are profit-minded and profit-oriented. They're just taking advantage of this in a way that damages the stance of women and what they want to achieve and what they stand for. This inherently already sabotages and shoots the feminist movement right in the foot. Government has said about how these ads are just to spread awareness and not really forcing the consumers to buy these products. But let me ask you, are, ads, are the purpose of ads not to generate the, the, the generate profit? Are the purpose of ads not to, want, not to make people want to buy the product? The motion offers product advertisement and not social advertisement. There's a very fine line, a very big difference between a social advertisement and a product advertisement. So at the end of the day, the end goal of the product advertisement is to sell. There's a, there's a very huge difference that I feel that like government has failed to recognize. 
So on to my first argument, which is this, these, feminist move, these feminist movements that are incorporated into the apps for products does not serve positively for the fight against stereotypes for women as a whole, which directly sabotages the feminist movement. What do I mean by this? Note that the motion here today specifically states that the fem feminism narratives are in app that they specifically state that they want to incorporate the feminism movement, the narratives into app surrounding fashion and beauty. What are the issues that feminism faces nowadays? What are the common fights that they, they need to keep getting attacked with? Insults that they keep getting thrown at them. Women should stay in the kitchen and whatever those are, and they're only good for makeup and they spend too much money on time and makeup and fashion. With all these ads that are mainly talking about feminism, feminism in the context of beauty and fashion, but most importantly, this is the portrait of a woman at the front. Now, these beauty products are being highlighted as an even more significantly a female thing, a women's only thing. Stereotypes will then run rapid and become even more serious as they, they will be having a harder time to escape such a narrative. When we focus these feminism movements on ads specifically for products yeah. such as beauty and fashion, no thank you, the society has... In, indirectly push all these responsibilities and roles that a woman must own up to and fulfill. It only further cements them into this role, i.e. maybe you can make it easier, but it's still they're still being fixed into this role. This makes the feminist movement all very counterproductive and quite frankly sabotaging the whole movement. Women are already fixed into the position of having to prepare makeup, having to hyperfixate on their fashion choices and their appearance with these unaccomplished beauty standards. While the love yourself motivations are good to have and good empowerment, What's for more further needed for the whole movement is to break free from these chains, to escape from these beauty products and these fashion uh, requirements. What these love your curves and whatever all these examples that Motion has given are just conforming to the norms, are just conforming to the standards and saying it's okay to set new standards. But standards at the end of the day are still standards. It still locks women into this field where they need, they need to purchase this product. Of the the need to purchase these products. They are not breaking free from these, cha these chains. They are only just turning them into fluffy handcuffs. It is not productive at all. The motion of using feminism in these ads are quite literally not helping. It is still forcing women into using such products. It is still forcing them to buy. It is still influencing, to, influencing them to buy, feeling that they need these products. This is just how things work because a company is promoting these things. A company is in introducing these ads that slap feminism on its packaging and call it a day. After about how I talk, after I talked about how this negatively affects women and the feminist movement, here's how the harms for these for these feminism ads can arrive for men as well. Not to take, of course, not to take away the narrative from the women, but I believe that it is extremely important that we recognize how this ads surrounding feminism and surrounding beauty products can affect multiple sides of the gender spectrum as well. The constant barrage of ads for beauty products that want to include feminism, as I've said before, is because of the surge of popularity and the surge of influence for such movements, which means this will further hammer down the fact that women are the main consumer for these products. Although, yes, the movement of feminism is for the empowerment of women, empowerment of women and not for the depowerment of men. However, we need to keep in mind how the majority receives and interprets such info. If we cannot instantaneously change the way a majority of men see things as it is simply impossible at this point in time, this ne the next best thing to do is to alter how we deliver the message to make it more consumable so we can get more men on board with the feminist movement. Now, I'll explain why this is relevant and why this is important. See, whether we like it or not, feminism movements need the support of feminist men as well as the women, as well because the women only hold half of the population. Yet enforcing feminism into such ads that only center around beauty and fashion only further perpetuates the narrative that men are not encouraged to use such makeup and products as these are for women. This, harm, this is harmful because this is only going to further induce the, such toxic masculinity into the society. Let me make this clear again that it is not the fault of anyone that this could be happening, but it is just human nature and how people interpret things. And as, society, we, and as, a, society, as a society, we have to be considerate and understanding. So we can move forward, actually moving forward and not just make or not just create make-believe slogans that won't do anything for the movement as a whole. Furthermore, to the men who are still stubborn in their misogynistic ways, these products only serve as an alleyway for them to keep being in this mindset and just on the surface become a better person. It is very easy for people to say they're a feminist and they support the movement and flaunt the products that use feminism as a branding while remaining a misogynist silently. See, this already actively harms feminism as this is not just what the movement really needs. In order for feminist movements, such, for movements such as feminism to get real results and to make a real influence and real impact, they need to have strength in numbers. 
And that number comes from men as well, enlightened men who are in support of feminism. With the example of policymakers that I will make today, sadly, at this point in the world, many politicians at, are still men. Yes, the ideal goal would be for equality, would be for women to stand an equal margin for policymakers as well as men. But it is just too far of a goal now for us to achieve. The best that we can do now is to have to, to have this influence to influence men to be for the feminist movement. And then will they be willing to step back and women will have a fairer chance to fight for the equal rights that they want. In my speech, what they want and what they deserve, by the way, in my speech, I have given you a real definition of what a real context for today's debate is about to look like and how this involvement of feminism in product ads for beauty and fashion products will all, not only harm women, men, and also the whole movement of feminism in general. I will end my speech here today. Thank you very much. I am the speaker for the final speech. Can I have Brock second? Uh, yes, sorry, just a second to ready my timer. Um, meanwhile, am I both uh, audible and visible? Yes, you are. Um, okay, before I begin, I'd like to outline that I go by he, him pronouns, and I'd like to accept my POIs verbally, please, and thank you. Okay, I will begin my speech in three, two, one. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I would like to focus on rebutting some of the opposition leaders' points, as well as developing the points made by our first speaker, Christian. Firstly, I would like to tackle the uh, opposition's redefinition of our motion. While we do not completely disagree, the opposition has failed to recognize that we share the same final goals of empowerment and promotion of equality, gender equality. As my first speaker mentioned in his first two points, the, the and has defined, beauty is not just looking good, but feeling good in yourself. So therefore, we believe that the goal is empowerment. And now, the alternative presented to by the opposition that it is not, in fact, empowering is that they are focused, that companies will be more focused on the sales aspect, which I will dwell into in a, in a bit with my, the rest of my rebuttals. But this is why I like to stand by the government's definition, because we believe we have defined all the keywords accurately. In fact, they tack, they... <clears throat> They rebutted our definition of advertisements, but in fact, to directly quote my friend Christian, he talked about advertisements as a general display of the products to public in order to appeal to the public. So, in fact, we, we do agree with your. Uh, I'm sorry, we do agree with your definition of advertisements as one as promoting products, making them look attractive in order for people to buy. But this is where we end the line. We do not agree that companies are baseless and faceless in doing so, and are only just prompting out taglines such as love your curves, beauty has no limits, etc, etc, in order to make money. This is very, this is completely unethical and immoral. And we believe that the reason companies are doing this, yes, they are doing it to make money. But however, it does not end there. It has more depth to it. It has much more depth to what companies are doing. Now, considering cop is mostly targeted towards women. We do agree that it's targeted towards men, and we do also believe that that is a great thing for companies to do. While the while um the first speaker has brought up points about how this the including female narratives in including feminine narratives in advertisements will lead to a lack of focus in men and thus eventually snowballing to toxic masculinity. This point was baseless and did not have enough depth in order to prove its how true it is, and that's exactly why it is false. In fact, he talked about how there needs to be more male feminists in order, as well as female feminists, in order to actually promote gender equality and reach gender equality. Yes, we completely agree, but there is no direct linkage between having feminine narratives and not having male supporting women. Because in fact, some of these companies will be run by both female and men who are pr prompting out these taglines in order to promote women. Therefore, sorry, Therefore, this does not lead to toxic masculinity. And furthermore, as, as a worst case, let's say that it does, even though it doesn't, there are still taglines and such that do promote men as well as women, as in not, not at the same time, but there are stuff for men as well, such as, for example, Gillette with their count countless taglines about real men are shaped, etc., etc. I'm not sure about the exact wording. But okay, so that is why this, that is why uh, side government believes that Toxic masculinity here is not an issue. Secondly, I'd now like to talk a rebut about how the the gov sorry the opposition was very sale minded. Yes, this is for them to sell the products. However, it is not just a it is not just a raw ad of products. It, it is also a social advertisement. While you disagree about it being a social advertisement, the fact of the matter is that it is. 
while they do want to encourage sales, they also want to encourage a better world in which women feel empowered in their own skin. And by their own skin, this is when they feel beautiful, not as looking good, as my first speaker has mentioned, but instead as feeling confident and empowered, regardless of the way they look right now, the shape, the size, etc. That is why these companies are not only sale-minded. While it does fuel their sales, yes, but they're also doing it for the right cause. If something was negative that were to fuel their sales, wouldn't they do that? Maybe, but they're not doing it. Instead, they're doing the right thing in order to fuel sales. Therefore, it is not wrong of them to fuel sales. It is, it is, it is their job as a company to want higher sales, but they're doing it in the right way, a way in which empowers women. So the fact of the matter is that their only goal is not to generate profit. There's much more depth to that. They're generating profit in a much more sust sustainable and efficient way, which makes everyone in the society feel comfortable in their own skin. Therefore, redefining beauty from its negative standards, like my friend, like Christian first speaker mentioned in Korea, the, the use of social media, where people are editing their bodies heavily and posting it, making this the normal. Such extremes have gone too far to redefine beauty. So perhaps what the companies are doing here, in fact, not perhaps, in fact, what the companies are doing here is not only to generate profit, but to redefine beauty. And the first step is to do it by boosting out these taglines, which will, yes, we agree, generate profit, but also empower women, because that's the main goal here. Okay, now that I'm done with my rebuttals, I'd like to go into elaborating on our own points. First, I'd like to introduce another point is about setting an example. These fashion, in, in such an age of social media, where little kids from around the age of 10, 12, or even younger are getting onto social media, getting their own handles, getting their own accounts, being exposed to content of unrealistic beauty standards and impossible to achieve features and looks is not a healthy, is not a healthy world. And so with companies releasing taglines about loving yourself and finding peace and beauty within yourself is the perfect thing to do in order to empower not just current women, but young women, young girls who will grow up to be women. Because in order to solve gender equality, it is not it is, it is not an easy it is not an easy problem. It is not an easy fix. It is a problem that has existed for years, decades, centuries, right? So the first step, one of the steps of many, is also to change the mindset of those who are younger. This is why it is very important that this is targeted towards younger women, girls as well, in order for them to get the right perspective and the right idea. Therefore, with that. I would like to conclude my speech by saying that your definition was baseless and did not take into consideration of our points that we do indeed focus on empowerment and promotion of gender equality, whilst also trying to defeat the impression of unrealistic beauty standards and aiming to change, reform, spread awareness, and set a good example to young girls and women all around the world. With that, I end my speech. Thank you. I can the speaker for the speech. Can I have the alone? Right, give me a second to set up my things. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, just to double check, am I visible? Yes, you are. All right. So
second speaker of opposition side. Uh, prefer pronouns he, him, but you can refer to, refer to me by any pronouns. Doesn't really matter. POIs, preferably verbally. And I will take them if I have the time. And also, I'll usually take them after five. Right. Oh. Right, okay, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. I think it's very important to consider today that in this debate today, what we're advocating for is the best interest of the feminist movements, right? So for the feminist movements that actually work, what they're, what they're trying to achieve is gender equality, right? So for gender equality and for feminist movements to work, they require acceptance from both spectrums of the gender, okay? I think that is something that's very factual, something that both sides have to concede, is that in order for feminist movements to actually gain traction and to actually evoke the change that they want, they have to change not only the women, but also the men, right? So that's the first thing that I want to clarify. Okay, so my speech today, I'll be giving a few things. Firstly, I'll be giving some uh, rebuttals to side government's, uh, side, uh, government's case, Secondly, I'll be giving two arguments, namely, firstly, uh, sorry, I'll be giving two arguments, right? So let's just directly get to this. So in the first speaker of government, they tell us that uh, uh, by empowering women, what we can see is actually that we can discourage beauty standards, right? But actually, I want to flip that and say that that is actually not true. By tying the fact that, uh, as my first speaker has said, when you, imply, when you, when you slap um, feminism narratives and slogans onto these fashion and beauty products, what by reading through in between the lines, what you're implying kind of is that it is a woman's thing to have makeup and uh and and fashion products, right? So what this does is firstly, as my first speaker has mentioned, this means that um it, it makes it seem that men can't use or you can't use these fashion products or these makeup products. Right? It indirectly tells them that this is something that's very women, something that's very feminine, right? And so it perpetuates toxic masculinity. And we all know that toxic masculinity is bad for women because it means that men have the idea that, oh, I'm strong, or I cannot cry, or men cannot use makeup and uh, have a uh, weapon color, for example, right? Secondly, I think this is bad because when you imply that women and makeup go hand in hand, what you you're sort of telling them, oh, with makeup, you can become this very beauty. You can become very beautiful. Like, oh, with makeup, oh, with this and that, you can become someone that is very beautiful. So actually, what I think is that it, this actually encourage, encourages the toxic beauty standards because you tell women that, oh, uh, you with the with makeup, you can become someone that's very beautiful, right? And secondly, they tell us that uh, this spreads awareness, right? But I want to ask whether, okay, I, I agree yeah. that the fact that advertisements are to spread awareness. No, thank you. But I would like to ask the government whether or not this awareness is one that is good. Whether or not this uh, awareness is necessarily something that's good. And I'll tackle that in my arguments later. Right? Also, they tell us that uh, corporations are not so, not so profit-minded. Right? They tell us that corporations actually they are not so unethical or they're not so immoral. They have a lot more depth to it. Right? But they never tell us what this depth is. Right? They tell us that corporations are not, they're not so unethical, they're not so immoral, but they never tell us why we are inclined to believe that. They never tell us that why this is likely more feasible, right? So I think that our characterization of corporations still stands. Namely, that corporations are someone that's profit-minded, not because they're immoral or unethical, but because corporations are is simply their social responsible to be profitable. Because in this cap capitalistic society, it is a co company's social responsibility to be profitable. It's not something that's good or inherently good or inherently bad. It's just something that the way it is because we live in a capitalistic society. Okay, that is something that I want to know. Because the side government did not give us enough analysis on why their side of character characterization actually works, right? They also tell us that corporations uh, also want to encourage women to feel confident and empowered. But again, they never tell us why that is the case. Why it is in the corporation's best interest to tell to empower women to feel confident and uh, feel confident and feel empowered. They never tell us why that is the case, right? Okay, so to tackle with that down, okay, secondly, I also want to talk about how they say that uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to, uh, sorry, feminist narrative doesn't necessarily need to male uh, toxic toxic masculinity, right? Because they say like, oh, for, they give the example of, a certain, for example, Gillette, the a shaving company, they put advertisements like what, real men shave something. 
But I would like to ask whether or not these are actually considered feminist narratives because they never endlessly tell us what their feminist, nar feminist narratives will look like. And I want to ask them whether or not these are actually included in the feminist narratives. So I think that point just goes out the window, right? So I'll move on to my points. Firstly, Okay, corporations see the, the, the rise of feminist movements something, is some, that is something that's attractive to them, right? Because by aligning with the feminist movement, what they, they can seem like a more women-empowering company. But we run the risk of what I would like to call fan washing, kind of like green washing, right? Where you put in slogans just for the sake of it or just for the sake of profit, right? And I think this is bad in two ways. Firstly, it detracts from possible gender inequality inside the actual company, i.e. when women don't get enough pay or that women are mistreated in, mistreated in office or in meetings, right? They can look like feminist companies on the facade, on the face of it, so that they can get scrutinized less about the possible discrimination that comes when women face in the office room or in the production facility, right? So feminizing plays no role in the fight for women's inequality if the company doesn't live up to these feminist ideals, right? So you are. rather, it might actually be detrimental to the movement. And I'll tell you why is that because it can invoke an unhealthy competition between companies who would look like, rather than improving the quality of the product, which takes a, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and it's not in their, in, in their best interest because it takes a lot of time and money, but actually out for an easier, more convenient route, which is to compare who has the best feminist slogans, right? Who has the most extreme, who can empower women, quote unquote, empower women the most, right? And this is against the best interest of the feminist movement in two, case, in, uh, two cases. Firstly, is the, the radical radicalization of the feminist movement, right? So as I mentioned, the awareness that you spread, yeah, you spread awareness, but is it necessarily a good awareness? Because we think that by blowing these, why companies are uh, having these unhappy uh, companies and be making the feminist movement more radicalized, what you spread is actually bad representation. You spread incorrect representation because things are blown out of proportion because when the feminist movements become more and more extreme, things get misrepresented. This is bad because it dilutes the message of feminism. Namely, that feminism will build, boil down to slogans like work it girl or like show your curves or things like that, right? Feminism will only boil down to these slogans and not what actually feminism is trying to advocate for, right? And so what this does is you lose supporters, especially male supporters. And as we have mentioned in our context, male supporters are very important as well because in the fight for feminism, male supporters can play a key role as well. So this is against the best interest of the feminist movement that function via the power in numbers, right? So second argument namely is that it runs the risk of, feminist narratives runs the risk of becoming just for visibility, right? So there's a few things that uh, we need to clarify. Feminism and feminist products become popular when they don't actually challenge deep structural inequalities because it's boiled down into slogans and it's more attractive to say, I'm worth it uh, rather than fight the 10,000, fight the thousand thousands of years of women's inequality and fight, uh, Fight these the Supreme Court trying to overturn the fight the Supreme Court that's trying to overturn abortion rights, right? It's much more attractive to just say I'm worth it or like show your curves, right? Something that's very vague, something that can boil down the slogan, something that's catchy, right? And secondly, advertising consumer culture is where we have hopes, fears, and guilt, and companies use these emotions to their advantage to sell us products, right? So I think it's great that we have, for example, a 20-year-old walking around the street, something that says, like, empower women. I think that's great. But I think we should not leave it at that. And that's why I worry about all, this, all of this advertisement. That just stays about Everything just stays very surface level. It runs the risk of everything just being very facade right? The T-shirt of empower women actually becomes the politics rather than the, uh, the step taking a step in further and trying to resolve the women's inequalities in the world, right? So what this happens is that a lot of people, the consumers who buy these products, they become virtue signaling, right? Because they say, they might feel guilty about uh, not being able to support the feminist movements or like, for, to fight for actual women's rights, like to abortion rights, for example. But what they can do is that they can buy these products and they can say, oh, I support feminism. Oh, I support feminism. They do virtue signaling, right? They're not actually challenging the structural inequalities in the country or in the system, but rather just using this as a way to satisfy their guilt of not being able to actually challenge these deep structural inequalities. And this applies for both men and women, right? So today in my debate, I've given you a few things. Firstly, I've given you a few rebuttals to cite government's case. Secondly, I've given you two arguments. Namely, firstly, that uh, this is uh, the unhealthy competition between companies would actually be in the not in be in the best interest of the feminist movements. And secondly, that it runs the risk of just being about visibility. And with that, I end my speech. Thank you very much.
I turn the speaker for the final speech and I have to go third. Uh, thank you. Just give me a minute. Let me set my timer up. Right. Right. So, okay. uh, good afternoon to everyone present, the government, the opposition, and the adjudicators. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm the third speaker for the government team. And before I start, I would like to be, I would like to ask if I can be heard clearly. Yes, you can. All right. Awesome. Okay. So to outline, I go by he, him pronouns. I believe it was Emma Watson who said, uh, and she's a prominent member of the feminist society, and she once mentioned, and I quote, if you are for feminism, you are for equality. And it's as simple as that. This very statement sums up why the government is advocating for the inclusivity of feminist narratives in fashion products. So yes, we agree with what your first speaker mentioned. Feminism is female empowerment. But you're extremely incorrect in suggesting that female empowerment is not equality. I mean, that's just perjury. You're taking a definition neatly and elegantly defined by our prime minister and miscommunicating it to the chair. That's just absurd. Remember, it's no secret that society has, since the dawn of time, upheld the feminine population much more than the male population to look good and carry themselves in an attractive manner. That's why such feminist narratives should exist to empower this group of females who have been marginalized against. So that for once, they're equal to the masculine population. Something that, to my dismay, is something you don't understand. Because this government is for equality. And both the first and spe second speakers from my team have addressed just how these advertisements manage to campaign equality. In a point of information made earlier on, earlier on your team suggested that fashion and beauty products are not cheap. First off, that is just your personal opinion. Not all fashion and beauty products are expensive. Moreover, you're missing the entire point of this debate. But if we were to take your stance for a second and imagine a world where feminist narratives are not campaigned in advertisement, would that stop people from spending money on fashion and beauty products? Of course not. So that makes your counter argument intensely invalid. So if fashion products will always have a market like they do as of today, why shouldn't we take that audience, that market, that opportunity to educate society on the feminist movements? The orthodoxical conditions that you that society has imposed on the female population. I mean, if businesses will make money from makeup anyway, which you suggest, why shouldn't we, the society, use our sound ethics to reduce the disconnect between genders in our society in its very market anyway? I mean, and the worst part is the opposition hasn't been able to answer this. And that just proves the validity of our arguments. To add, we'd like to reiterate that this government supports the inclusion of masculine narratives in advertisements of fashion and beauty products just as much. Both sides of the coin face intense marginalization due to unrealistic beauty standards set by society. So such advertisements will, of course, definitely do much benefit in contributing to a more equal community. However, the opposition treats the motion as if who says you school in narrating food? You use vague descriptors like the word things and that these things won't work and sorry, just the second speaker of you mentioned that promoting makeup to men doesn't sorry rejected. That promoting makeup to women does not correlate. Uh, you're a bit batching. Can you check your connection? I'm oh, sorry. Am I audible now? Yeah, that's better. You can continue from where you okay. started, just to like five seconds drop noise. All right. Sorry. Um, let me just stop. Okay. Um, where was I? So, um, but yes, the opposition does treat this motion as an either or situation. I mean, you can have masculine narratives as well as campaigning for feminine narratives. The second speaker of your team mentions that promoting makeup to women does not correlate whatsoever to whether men can use makeup. I mean, 
it makes no sense. What are you trying to say? Maybe we need to take a break so that the opposition team can formulate more structured and meaningful arguments. But I'll just move on. Because these masculine narratives that you think doesn't exist does indeed exist. Males are already empowered in their own manner. There are plenty of fashion and beauty products for the male population that present masculine narratives already. So no, fashion and beauty products aren't just for females. To elaborate on what our second speaker was explaining to the audience, companies like Gillette already share advertising more mottos like, and I quote, the best a man can get and the shape made for a man, empowering males to reach their full potential just as well. And what your team is doing is calling these masculine narratives feminist narratives. I mean, that's not true. They're two different things. Why do I need to explain this? But your team chooses to generalize the two anyway. And I must inform you, you can't just turn a blind eye to that and make counter arguments that have zero grounded basis. To add, our stance would be setting an example for everyone, something that the opposition has failed to appreciate. Our second speaker has mentioned that fashion and beauty products of such nature set an example for the young population to look up to, promoting a more open-minded and inclusive society all around. These advertisements also preach rightful morals and ethics to the entire population, empowering not just females, but males and everyone else to treat one another equally and to empower one another, because that's how society works. And this government likes that idea. But despite a second speaker trying countlessly to find a common ground for both teams to agree on, the opposition has been completely distracted from doing so. In fact, the opposition has suggested that one of their best cases is that implementing feminine advocacy in, in, in advertisements doesn't remove any standards. However, if you, if you, if since you said that a bunch of businesses make profits, and this is something that they already already do, as I mentioned, why can't we take this opportunity anyway to spread awareness of this feminist movement? The use of feminist narratives encourages the awareness of already existing foundations that advocate for reducing women's struggles. As female inequality is something that still occurs in the current. So worst comes to worst, all we do is get one step closer to achieving the goal of gender equality. That sounds better than not advocating anything at all, which is what the opposition has suggested. Let's just leave it to the businesses, right? That makes no sense. And you also fail to realize that if we do not advocate for such advertisements, these corporations that you call profit-minded and that you consider toxic and harmful, will just use addictive marketing to earn more profits. What's forcing or encouraging them to advocate for equality at all in your case? So creating conversations between society, adopting a more progressive mindset, broadening the idea of feminism, something which I don't believe the opposition has been able to do. That is what our team is doing today. All the opposition did was throw around descriptors such as radical and the second speaker's favorite phrase, show those curves, not understanding what we're debating for. They're debating for a step in the right direction. And that is always better than no step at all. What you're suggesting is not to do anything. Your absence of a counter argument to the use of feminine narratives and advertisements prove that firstly, the opposition is misguided. But I've said that already. What we've also mentioned is that feminism is not an absolute. It's something we should do anyway, because it's the right thing to do. And I believe my arguments have justified that. Thank you very much. I think this figure for the final speech. Can I have a quick? Yeah, just a simple confirmation. Uh, am I both visible and audible? Yes, you are. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, just give me one second to drink a sip of water, then I'll be commencing a big uh, speech. All right, um, no preference gender pronouncers, anything's fine. And PY preferences verbally, I'll take it at five. Okay. Starting speech in three, two, one. Wearing a let's go feminism shirt and talking to family supporters. I doubt that many uh I doubt that majority of them actually know what feminism means. Okay. I think that panel, the main problem for opposition for government is that they think rhetorics and vague definitions with fancy words are enough to prove their logic of their side. To which I quote the third speaker of side uh, government saying, It's I think that it's way too convenient for government side to get away with saying to use a quote from Emma Watson to link the immense logic between advocating feminism 
and advocating for equal rights. Note that I've identified a lot of soft stances coming from government and, and a few major contradictions towards their two substantive speakers and also the weak speaker. Okay, so let's go in the order of the weak speaker first. They tell you, you can have masculine narratives, but also feminist narratives. Notice that this is a directly new logic coming from the whip speaker to which let's still engage on this. Number one, I think that this is a relatively soft stance that requires a very major burden to, to be proven in which masculine narratives have never even been considered by our first two speakers. Second, we're living in a patriarchal, uh, patriarch, uh, status quo with patriarchal context. Therefore, masculine has always pressured feminist narratives. And are we much more inclined to believe that if you were to have both masculine narratives and also feminist narratives in the same place, it's much more likely for feminist narratives and their significance to be diluted in the get go. Second layer of rebuttal. They tell, the third speaker tells you that fashion and beauty products are for everyone to share. Yes, I think that this directly shoots themselves in the foot because, yes, this goes to prove that fashion and beauty products are for everyone to share. This is a society asset that should be shared by everyone despite the differences in gender. But the nuance here is simple. Inside government's world, you're putting a feminist narrative now on something that should have been shared by everyone that qualifies something as, as female and as, as, as feminist or, and something that's not masculine. The third layer here is, but then note this panel, PM and DPM's arguments that the points of representation of the uh, of government's bench is hinged upon the logic of female of feminist narratives being the significant narrative here and um. And this directly contradicts these, uh, and this directly shows why there's a soft stance coming from the weak speaker, which, uh, which is directly contradictory to the, to the stance that the two previous speakers have already taken. And I would further note why are there a lot of vague definitions to which I do not necessarily understand what they are trying to prove, in which I would quote, the speaker told us that a lot of masculine examples, I'm, I'm, I'm much more inclined to not believe what the a lot actually quant is actually quantified to be. Okay, the second speaker. I think that the second speaker has told us, number one, they tell you that you females need to feel good. I think that this likely this likely proves my uh, my DRO's point because this goes to show how government's case is one that only has tractions in terms of only visibility. This cannot warrant a pass in terms of leg legitimate tractions for feminist movements. So you're only do, do, doing this for the lofty aspirations of all of the individuals to which they don't necessarily abide by the uh, main goal for feminist movements. Even if women feel good, why is this still bad for the main contingent of the debate, which is the best interest for feminist movements? I get this directly takes down opposition's point. Why is this so? This is a very strategic response towards side government because now you are taking away the incentives and motives to support feminist movements. Why is this so? This, the reasons are threefold. Number one, notice that uh, that feminist, uh, feminist supporters join feminist movements to feel included. And the advocacy for feminist goals is actually something that's secondary. The second layer. So, in terms of priority, it is then more likely for feminist movement supporters to be diluted of the enthusiasm to cater to the family feminist movements. Now that they are now that they are able to believe in their own sloppy aspirations as being included and as telling themselves in their own subjective manner that they are what that they are one of the feminist uh, movement supporters. The next point is basically the the contingent the clash between corporations. Notice that corporations, uh, corporations in status quo are, I think that first, I would like to point out that government is running a relatively soft case to which PM tells you that they would buy it, but D DPM suddenly comes in and tells you that they suddenly will buy it. I don't necessarily know what they're trying to go for in terms of mechanism, and if they want to do it in reply, it's too little too late. Corporations essentially look like, even if they are not profit-oriented, let's engage with this. If this is even in terms of social advertisement, this still ostracizes men away from the discussion with feminist movements, to which we've already told you why the uh, the appreciation and the accept, uh, acceptance of men is relatively, uh, is relatively important into this debate. The fourth rebuttal here is, even if advertisements happens, let's consider this in two ways. It's either going to be blown out of proportion, which directly goes against the best interest of feminist movements. Second, let's take government at their best. Even if you do get real and adequate representation, we tell that this is only about visibility because it's much more convenient for individuals on the ground to opt for virtual signaling, not actually challenging the deep uh, structural inequalities. That is a burden that side of side government has not proven in order for all of the arguments to stand. For the first speaker, I think that the prerequisite to the, to the empowerment argument is for females to buy the product, in which fashion and beauty con products are not necessarily cheap. How does he engage with this POI? I think that the response is unrealistic. He told you that not everyone will buy this, but then this actually contradicts what the second speaker hinged the representation point upon. Now, note that corporations will then will not have the incentive to produce such products because uh, this is 
uh, to produce such products and at best this is going to be deprived of quality because now there's not going to be now you're not going to be generating enough revenue for them to have the incentive and resources to actually uh, actually research more about better products and this goes to directly bolster my dpl uh, my dl's points of telling you why this is one that's likely to likely to look like actually entirely focusing more on uh, advertising rather than actually catering to the issue of structural inequalities. Therefore, gender inequality requires acceptance of both spectrums of gender, not the empowerment of one side. Even if that is the case, government still has a massive burden on their side to say why the empowerment will lead to engagements between male and female, to which we've already told you why this is likely only going to materialize in terms of antagonizing male, because the mental calculus here is simple. We tell you that this goes against the best interest because we can split this, two, this into two parts. You are directly qualifying a society's asset that should have been um, celebrated by everyone irrespective of your gender. Even if you are able to gain traction, we tell that this is deprived of the movement's potential due to how males do see this. For the normal average day male, the mental calculus here will look like, oh, so I'm male, but this is not a feminist thing. This instills a pre-connotation of being left out and being ostracized, hence leading to the alienation of females by males. Second, I think that this is worse when you discuss about the patriarchal context. This is going to be a gunpowder to further oppress feminism. This gives them the reason to scrutinize them over, hence further fragmenting the connection between males and females, di in in indirectly antagonizing males, resulting in the polarization of females as a whole. So today, I'd like to end my speech by saying this. Yes, you can you can advocate for, for feminism, but what we want is literal and legitimate traction, not one that's only visible and for lofty aspirations. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the speech. Can I have a reply? Hello. Oh. Right, sorry, sorry. We're having a bit of connection issue. Give me a second. Confirm, am I visible and audible? Yes, you are. You're going to start. Yep. All right. Okay. Okay. So I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Right. So when we look at the two sides of today's world, what do these two sides look like? Okay. Right? So in our side of the world, our side looks like the status quo where there are already feminist movements actively trying to push for women's rights. But what they do is that they, they decide not to include feminist narratives inside of these fashion products and these makeup products, right? In opposition worlds, the feminist movement uh, does, right? They, uh, they in try to include these feminist narratives in the advertisements, advertisements of fashion and beauty products, right? So these are the two worlds of uh, today's sites. Right. So what has uh, side government told you today? I think I can boil down side government's arguments into two parts. So they tell us firstly that they empower women, right? They tell us that they discourage beauty standards. And secondly, what they do is that they tell us that they spread uh, awareness, that they create discussion. These are the main two points that side opposition are advocating for, right? So before we get into that, I would first likely, again, like to clarify that today, the burden of today's debate is who accommodates the best interest of the feminist movement, who can actually push for actual change and for women's rights uh, to be equal as men's rights, right? We are advocating for equal rights. And secondly, we also gave you a lot of context about how, for example, corporations, whether good, whether uh, not necessarily not necessarily that they are, that they, this is a good or bad thing, corporations are profit minded. That is just a state of the fact, right? And secondly, that to have actual change, 
feminist movements need to uh, take into account male supporters as well, right? Because we tell you how in this patriarchy, and especially with governments that have a lot of male-dominated, for, as, as, for example, feminist movements rely on power and numbers. So they need the support of male supporters as well, right? So they firstly, moving on to their... Uh, 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 their arguments. Firstly, they tell us that they empower women, right? Because they tell us uh, they become less conscious, right? It makes them become strong and uh, promotes uh, the sense that uh, I can feel I can feel confident, I can feel good, and discourages beauty standards, right? Right. So we concede that the fact that they women can feel empowered, right? Women can feel confident in their own body, but we don't agree with the point that they say that it discourages beauty standards. Instead, we actually say that they encourage these beauty standards because when you imply women and makeup go hand in hand, this makeup it, it can imply to the woman to say that these makeups, uh, you need these makeups to become beautiful, right? So in outside of the world, we tell you, uh, what my first speaker has told you is that what with these sort of narratives, you lock women inside into this uh, narrative again that makeup is something that's inherently women and something makeup and fashion is something that's inherently women. And my third speaker has already told you why this is a bad thing. Because a lot of products that are supposed to be neutral gender, now you slap feminist narratives onto them. This means that you ostracize the male supporters. The male supporters are not the, the male consumers are not that likely to buy these products anymore because these products seem to be made inherently for women because you slap feminist narratives onto them, right? Secondly, they tell you that they spread awareness and they create discussion. And, in, and we think, and we concede that because advertisers are made to create discussion, right? But we tell you that these awareness or these discussions are not necessarily good discussion, right? We tell you that these discussions are not necessarily productive and that they don't actually work towards the production of, uh, uh, to invoke change in today's society, right? We tell you that because, uh, sorry, we tell you that because when these companies who are a bit, uh, who are more profit minded, they what they run the risk, of, what they run the risk of is fan washing, right? What they do is that they put slogans just for the sake of it, or for the sake of profit. So this is track the tracks from the possible gender inequality in the company itself, and also creates this unhealthy competition between the companies where they can see who likes more extreme feminist, uh, feminist slogans, right? Okay, and we tell you another point, namely that this runs the risk of becoming a feminist movement become very, very surface level, right? something that's only for visibility. It's only about a 20 year old walking around the street, something that says empower women, but not actually invoking change in today's society, right? And to that, I end my, re I end my reply speech. Thank you very much. I turn the speaker for the speech. Can I have a couple of slides? Yes, just a minute. Uh, just a minute to get my timer ready. Uh, meanwhile, am I both visible and audible? Yes, you are. Okay. I will begin my speech in three, two, one. Today, government side is proud to say that feminist feminist narratives should be included in advertisements, and I'll end this debate by talking about why by talking about the main clashes and why government believes we have won them. First, I'd like to talk about the main clash in this debate of how opposition um, considers the def definition of feminism to be a main structure. While we do not disagree, you look, you fail to consider the smaller picture. You keep on looking at the big picture, thinking about the structure, thinking about the end goal, the end goal, we have to reach it. While that is absolutely correct, in order to reach the end, there needs to be a beginning. In order to reach this, in order to begin the beginning, in order to start that, in order to reach the end goal, the bigger image, the bigger image is made of millions and millions of smaller images. And one of this is the inclusion of female of feminist narratives in advertisements. Including these taglines does not, does not mean, and I quote one of the speakers saying, feminism boiling down to slogans. That is in fact very contradictory as one of the speakers talks about the structure and yet another speaker talks about how feminism boils to just slogans. That is completely incorrect. Feminism does not boil down to one thing. It is a major structure, like you have mentioned, but something that big is not just reached directly. It needs to be approached step by step. And one of the steps, the correct steps to get there is by the inclusion of these narratives. Now, that clash aside, I'd like to talk about the second clash, the involvement of men. You talked about how producing and booming out or blasting out, as you have to quote you, blasting out these feminine narratives it excludes men. As we have mentioned countless times, the inclusion of feminine narratives does not directly mean the exclusion of masculine or male targeting. As we have mentioned multiple times, market segmentation exists. There are products that are targeted towards women. There are pro products that are targeted towards men. And there are products that are targeted towards the general population. So there is no shame and there is no harm in including 
taglines that support the feminine narrative while selling women's products. There are men's products too that do the same in order to sell it to them, which I'll talk about in the third class selling. But let me finish off with the second class. So yes, we truly believe that the market segmentation exists in order to achieve in order to achieve fruitfulness for everyone. And now the focus on the women's market should be to promote better empowerment, better reach a form of gender equality in order to reach a place where beauty is not this unrealistic standard of just looking good, but instead feeling good in your own skin and feeling empowered like all the speakers today on government side. <clears throat> sorry, that like all the speakers today on government side have mentioned. That is why this leading to toxic masculinity does not actually make any sense and it is not based because there are still products out there for men. Just simply including it for women does not exclude men. I find it quite ironic how you keep looking at the bigger picture, the infrastructure, the structure as you keep quoting, but you fail to see this simple point right underneath your noses. And now to end this debate with the final clash about selling. As we have mentioned, yes, companies are profit-minded. And as I have mentioned, and I have added depth, there are other objectives. But once again, let me spell it out. Profit is not the only objective. There are social objectives to companies too. And within social objectives, it is not a company versus company versus company scenario as you have suggested. Yes, that is towards profit, but social objectives exist too. And in this case, we strongly believe that the social objective should be in order to include feminine narratives in advertisements in order to support, empower women, empower women and, reach femininity, and reach femininity and gender equality one step at a time in order to build that so-called infrastructure, which you cannot just do. You talk about change as if it is easy. It is a step of multiple small, it is a process of multiple small steps that leads to the end greater goal, which is achieving equality. Therefore, I would like to conclude today's debate by, by saying that government believes that we have won because we truly believe as supported by our cases and the depth in our discussion today, the inclusion of feminine narratives in, advert, in fashion and beauty products is a must. Thank you. I thank the speaker and everyone for the debate. This is the round, so that is no result that is going to be given. But we're just to plug us for the break announcement. Bye bye. Have a nice day.